Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. This is the union session panel discussion on emotional well-being and career stress in earth science, uh, support for uh, support uh, uh, to meet the needs of the next centennial. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. I want to let you know that if you do want to think or talk more about this discussion on social media, we have the hashtag, uh, hashtag AGU Wellness that you can see on the screen right now, and I encourage you to tweet using it. So I want to give everyone a little bit of background on why this panel exists. Uh, we have been thinking for a little while on what are the different stressors that uh, earth science professionals are facing in their careers and how does that affect their well-being and then their productivity. It's really important that we think about these, these stressors and figure out ways that we can support our scientists so they can be productive, healthy, and happy as they do incredible earth science research. This is really important because the problems facing us currently with respect to climate change and other challenges in earth science are really important to solve. And without having a happy, healthy, productive workforce in order to solve those problems, we are going to be stalling and we're not going to be making enough progress or as much progress as we need to uh, to meet those needs. So I want to describe just some goals that we have for this panel. First of all, this panel was organized as a co-production between uh, climate scientists and data scientists. And on our panel this afternoon, we're going to have climate scientists and data scientists that are talking about different stressors and different topics in uh, well-being uh, that, that, that we may think about uh, with regard to the earth science community. Um, we're going to describe and discuss some of those challenges, and then we're going to consider ways that we can support uh, earth science professionals as we're preparing for the challenges in the next centennial. Uh, so throughout this session, we're going to be asking you if you have any questions, please write them on index cards. I think there are they posted in the in the back of the room. Uh, we're going to have index cards that are going to be posted in the back of the room. And if you're interested in writing a question for the panel, please write it down and then pass it forward to Shelly, who's in pink right here, and we will get that to the moderator. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note, and let me pull this up because I want to be very careful about how I say this, is that what we're discussing this afternoon is a sensitive topic. Because of that, we're going to ask that everyone, including panelists and audience members, remain respectful in their comments and discussion and adhere to AGU's code of conduct. The panelists today will be discussing themes which may be very difficult to discuss. We want to ask that you apply the golden rule as you consider the discussion today. When you leave from this session, think about how you would want to be talked about if you had been a part of the panel sitting up here. Please treat our panelists with respect and dignity as you would want to be treated both during and after the panel has concluded. At the same time, I want to remind the panelists that you are at all times in charge of what you say in this discussion. I encourage you to self-moderate while also inviting you to be courageous to help lift the taboo and discussing emotion, in discussing emotional well-being. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, I want to just say that our, the panel will be moderated by uh, Brandon Jones, who is the program director uh, for education and broadening participation programs at NSF. Brandon is also a member of a AGU's board of directors. So with that, I'll hand it off to our very first speaker, which is Erica. Welcome to this very special union session and uh, start of a very exciting week. My name is Erica Key. I'm the executive director of the Belmont Forum Secretariat. How many in the room know or have heard of Belmont Forum? Fabulous. This is working so well. I, I guess our communications are effective. Um, so for the few in the room or those who are joining us remotely who are not aware about Belmont Forum, we are an international group of funders supporting adaptation, mitigation, understanding of sustainability, of climate change, global change, uh, environmental change. We launch collaborative calls for proposals. We call them collaborative research actions, and that's going to be a really key part of um, my experience in career development, stress, and mental health is how to collaborate. So uh, we've launched 17 of these actions since we began in uh, 2009. It's our 10th anniversary. 
and they represent an interconnected nexus of knowledge, really threading together um, expertise from academia, from you know, public sector, private sector, um, citizen science, and the general public. We all have a stake in sustainability and recognizing and respecting each other's knowledge and being able to um, amalgamate that into a solution is, is really key to achieving success here. So as you can see, some of the words that pop out in this uh, platform of funding are resilience, security, sustainability, and climate, but also change, which can be perceived as threatening and frightening in a, a lot of contexts where uncertainty uh, features very prominently. Just to give you a scope of our universe that we're trying to build in this you know, collaborative way, we have 113 funding partners representing 73 countries. It's a lot of cross-cultural exchange. Uh, and they represent a number of different funding attitudes, if you want. So not just sort of fundamental science or applied science, but every mix therein. And we've supported 99 projects so far. We've actually uh, just agreed on a large tranche of new projects around uh, some new themes that we've co-developed. And we've committed over 105 million euros to those 99 projects. The teams represent a huge, diverse population that are learning how to work together. Nearly 2,000 named personnel in over 60 countries, and again, representing uh, different career paths uh, that have either relevance or in-depth knowledge within the sciences, not just earth sciences, but social sciences and humanities as well, which is a critical element to the sustainability pathways. Um, and we are happy so far to give some early statistics on gender representation that a third of these 99 projects are led by women. We can always do better, and we are looking deeper into the cohorts to understand roles, responsibilities, and um, the positivity towards enhancing um, women empowerment in science and stakeholder groups. So just some quick maps to give you ideas of this universe. These are the participant institutions in those projects, so you can see the range here. And the stars are where we have you know, uh, the largest number of transdisciplinary scientists. When they come together, they are not just working across borders and across disciplines, but across long-held institutional beliefs about science, trying to stretch and grow and do something new. That's not always rewarded in their home institutions. Um, we push them by requiring open data and open access. Again, it's something that resonates very strongly here at AGU, but maybe not beyond. Um, we try to give them support to build those teams and for the cohorts to come together to build a community. They are not alone. There are challenges to working in a transdisciplinary field. Um, there are vocabulary obstacles to overcome. There are respect issues. Um, we cannot refer to social science as those other people. Um, they are scientists. Um, they deserve the same respect that earth scientists do. And a stakeholder is not just a vessel to take your science to do. They are a partner. They co-develop and co-implement the project. They're the client. And they are going to create a legacy for the activity that extends long past the funding and actually can build uh, transformation within communities, governments, businesses, et cetera. So we bring them together at kickoff meetings, again at midterm and end term valorizations to ensure that they are um, supported in their activity and they recognize they don't have to do everything. They don't have to be a jack of all trades. I know what it feels like to be a jack of all trades. As an executive director, a single mother, a former oceanographer, now working in international 
NGO, and I used to be a U.S. government funding officer. So I can understand the need to be all things to everyone. In a Belmont Forum project, we want you to have partners. We want you to work together, and we want you to find that person that has a um, partnership attitude that me meshes with you and that you can work together and stretch and take a learning journey um, towards uh, change. Just to give you a couple of cautionary tales that we're working on, and I will wrap up there. Um, you can see here, we started off with blue. Blue is where our funded projects um, have, or the funded institutions engaged in the projects are. When we add red to the map, red is the project locations. That's where they're working. If it turns purple, great. If it turns red, problem. That means we are extending our science into areas where we're not working locally, where we're not respecting the, the locals and their knowledge. And so we really need to make sure all those reds turn to purple because we don't want to be guilty of scientific colonialism, if you want, going into a country, taking data, doing studies, and leaving with it, only to go back and maybe tell them what you think they should do. That's not the, the model we want to put forward. And then again, here as we add yet another color, if it turns black, wonderful. That means that we're communicating there as well as working. Um, so in, in total here, we recognize the change that uh, sustainability had put on the table, what the SDGs mean in terms of our future. And we're trying to provide not just the um, platform, but also the funding, the um, support, the training to enable transdisciplinarity and open access to thrive. So thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, so We've been asked to uh, introduce ourselves. So my name's Tim Rowling. I'm the CEO of Oscope. I won't ask you how many of you have heard of Oscope because I suspect not as many hands will go up. Oh, <laughs> Leslie's putting her hand up. She's part of our family though. So Oscope uh, is a non-for-profit company that's has been established for about 12 years in Australia. And we were um, established purely to fund earth and geospatial science research infrastructure investment. We're funded by the federal government through the Australian NCRIS program, which is the National Collaborative Research in Infrastructure Strategy. Uh, and we basically try to help geoscientists in Australia solve the great geoscience challenges um, that have been identified in a, in a number of ways for our uh, national community. So in that context, I'm going to talk a little today about how I see these challenges in an Australian context. Um, I suspect that, that we're not alone in the challenges we face in Australia, though. My background, uh, I'm not a data scientist or a climate scientist, unfortunately. I'm a structural ge geologist, but I do dabble in data, and I'm pretty passionate about looking at ways that we can provide data that can help uh, solve some of these problems through open data initiatives. So I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about trust issues. I want to talk about how we frame messages. And both of those are real challenges that I see for the next generation of geoscientists. And then I want to talk about open data because I think that that really is part of the solution. And we need to maybe change the way we think about data and publication and, and that whole process. So I'd like to introduce you to two of our politicians. Now, I don't want to uh, imply that the rest of the world has problems with politicians dealing with scientists the way Australia does. I'm sure America and England don't have these crazy right-wing politicians that we do in Australia. <laughs> but here are two of ours, George Christensen on the top, Bob Catter on the bottom. You may think I chose a deliberately unattractive photo of Bob, but that really is how he smiles, so um, I haven't. But these guys recently have been in the news because they've... <sighs> They're on like this crusade to undermine science in Australia. And supported by the coal lobby and supported by the Farmers Federation, they're looking at ways of proving or trying to disprove the science that indicates that runoff from coal mining and from agriculture in Queensland is damaging the Great Barrier Reef. 
And so they've sort of jumped on reproducibility, which is something we all understand is an issue that we have to face, but they've put some really emotional language around it, the reproducibility crisis. And so they basically undermine all of the science that gets done by sort of jumping on this bandwagon to the point where they want to uh, bring in this independent science quality assurance agency, which would be a federal government agency which would basically filter the science that gets done, that goes through the peer review process, which, you know, as we understand, as we all know, is the best way that you can do, check the reproducibility and check the quality of the data that comes out and of the science that gets done. Uh, and they want to put this layer on top, which filters which bits of science get through to the government. And, you know, you can imagine the sorts of people that they would like to get on these panels. I'm sure a few shock jocks and uh, ex-politicians would be on there. So I think that this issue really highlights the mistrust um, that is developing around science. And it's not just these guys, you know, the press, uh, social media, all of these issues, all of these sort of um, things are, are coming together to cause problems. There's a really good uh, paper called Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols in The Federalist. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you have a look at it. So this is one of the challenges that I think the next generation of geoscientists are going to have to deal with. And sort of adding another layer to that, um, something that my generation uh, of geologists or geoscientists didn't really have to worry about was how nuanced we have to be with the messages we deliver. So here are two images that are relevant to Australia. Tuvalu, uh, many climate scientists will know of Tuvalu, it's one of these countries that really, you know, if you look at the image, you can see that they care about sea level rise. The other one is the bushfires. If anybody's been following the news in Australia or even California over the last few years, um, you'll understand that at the moment it's spring in Australia. We don't have bushfires in spring and yet tomorrow, today the whole east coast of Australia is basically a light. You know, these are very graphic demonstrations of the stuff that's changing about our planet. And so we get passionate and we hear politicians saying, oh, no, it's not, climate change doesn't exist. You can't prove it. There's not enough science to prove it. Uh, and so we get passionate and we come out with these really strong statements. And, you know, we're passionate about science. So, of course, we do that. But it's just been uh, communicated to me how more careful we need to be about some of the statements we, we make. When we say there's going to be inevitably sea level rise which will wipe out Tuvalu, that's us trying to tell government they need to change some of their policies. But what it inadvertently does is it reduces the ability for Tuvalu to get investment. It basically reduces the ability for them to keep their kids living on the country that they call home. And it means that insurance costs with the bushfires, you know, insurance is almost impossible to get in Australia now. So these are real statements, they're truthful statements, but in a sense we just have to be really careful about how we frame them and I think that that's something we also need to think about and probably something that data can also help us with. So here's part of the solution, I think. We need to make some changes about the way we consider data. We need to provide data that's somewhat separated from the research. And I know that that's sort of anathema to the way we've been taught to do research. We collect our samples, we do our analyses, we publish our papers, and then, you know, hopefully we put our data out there somewhere as well. There have been big steps made recently with trying to get data out into these repositories which support our publications and, and forcing people to do that first. But I think we need to take a bigger step and we need to separate the data from the, the science because the data will always remain and the data will be the thing that underpins our science but also the next generation science as well. So we're trying to do things like um, uh, our, our seismometers in schools program which is putting research quality seismometers into secondary schools around the country, but in particular in areas that have issues like fracking that's going on. And so we're providing this unbiased data set that's being run by the schools and the school teachers, and it doesn't have this, this layer of, oh, well, that's the government that's doing that, or that's a university that's doing that, so they're pushing a political agenda. Uh, and I think if we, can, if we can look at other opportunities for collecting data that doesn't come with that, um, that political layer on top of it, uh, and we can separate it from the research, then we can value both equally, and I think that that will really help both our uh, next generation of scientists as well as the way that we um, communicate our science. 
so I think that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I will just leave with a positive um, message. Last week I went to Canberra and whilst I make fun of our politicians, we have this thing called Science Meets Parliament each year. I hope you have something similar in the US where we're able to go and meet with politicians. Uh, it was actually a fantastic experience and I met three politicians from all sides of parliament. Um, Adam Band, who's a Greens MP, uh, Richard Miles, who's from the Labor Party, our Democrats, um, and Katie Allen, who's from our equivalent of the Conservatives. And all of them are passionate about science, all of them are passionate about uh, delivering policy based on science and informed policy. And I think they're the next generation of politicians that we as the next generation of geoscientists need to support um, and communicate with. So I'd encourage uh, the young people in the audience to take every opportunity to engage with the politicians who they can work with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yasuhiro Murayama. I'm, uh, I'm working for NICT, which is the Japanese National Institute of Information and Communication Technology. And, uh, but it is, my background is based on the radio science, atmospheric science. And uh, so uh, this biograph shows so my uh, career and background. And the upper part is uh, mostly the my uh, uh, specific research, uh, related to specific research. And, and so uh, in atmospheric space science uh, context, uh, I have been working with the Japan Geoscience Union, which is a partner with the AGU. And also uh, AGU and IUGG, those are also uh, geophysical bodies, you know. And uh, in a, a lower part, you know, uh, I have been working for a data issue. Uh, and informatics. Uh, the, my institute is a host institute for World Data System, which is uh, our international enterprise of the International uh, Science Council. <laughs> I'm writing this as X, but uh, its name is now uh, ISC, International Science Council. And uh, uh, in that uh, context, uh, uh, I am our playing a role of the advisor for to the Japanese government uh, to promote open science policy in the government and the national bodies and they're also working with the European Commission colleagues and G7. All right. And uh, I have skipping, I have skipped uh, many things uh, to the, this biograph. This is a very much so kind of the conclusion for my discussion that in, a, in my sense that the science is now uh, today have had so much difficulty to work together with the citizen, to work uh, with the university, to work with the government. And uh, uh, I'm proposing to the science community that, especially in Japanese symposium in past, uh, I use this slide. Uh, the, so science is usually taken as a so research, scientific research. However, science cannot stand solely with research activity. Science can stand together with uh, publishing, uh, preserving, and reusing the uh, past knowledge. And those makes uh, our echo cycle of the knowledge, echo cycle of the science activities. Uh, those are, uh, enable us to accumulate the knowledge uh, which uh, promote the uh, community consensus of the scientific knowledge. For instance, like uh, IPCC, Inter Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. Uh, the IPCC's reports, as you know, were made by the thousands of scientists' uh, efforts reviewing writing uh, reports, uh, which enables uh, the uh, big impact for the many countries' government policies of carbon emissions and industrial control, etc. Uh, that's so. In this biograph, I show that the uh, so two arrows. Uh, one arrow is uh, our so science communities are consensus. This is the scientific knowledge can be used for general society, policymakers, funders, citizens, etc. And also the. Uh, yeah, 
uh, in a transdisciplinary approach, you know, uh, we need to be concerned with the, think about the co-design, co-production of the science. Uh, that means that so in a total of those uh, diagram are not uh, separate sectors. Those must be uh, one system to work together. So the, uh, uh, I am hoping to have this message uh, for the government and uh, for our next generation. And uh, uh, in my past experience, now I had uh, some contact with the government uh, discussion like uh, G8, G7. So G7, G8 are not uh, only the international government bodies, you know, uh, this is uh, just one example, but in my experience, I had uh, uh, worked together with the G7, and uh, uh, as you know that uh, 2013, the GA science ministers meeting uh, made an agreement of the uh, uh, open scientific research data. And uh, after that, Japanese government were uh, ho hosted the uh, science ministers meeting again in uh, Japan. And uh, I had the opportunity to have the uh, uh, introduce the open science concept to the science ministers in the meeting and they have agreed with uh, making a new working group under the G7 framework for open science especially. And uh, in uh, 2017, the science ministers agreed to uh, focus uh, two aspects of the open science. One is the rewards and incentives for scientists and research activities. Uh, that includes also the research career promotion. We need to be concerned with the, how the scientists are employed and the, how our scientists' career are promoted in the open science context. And also data infrastructure is a really important background for us too. And uh, reality is not necessarily a uh, good uh, ideal situation now, and um, still, for instance, in Japan, the many universities, professors are, are chosen are based on the, uh, uh, their research paper, number of the research papers. So their uh, publication list is only on uh, uh, scientific articles published in the journals. And sometimes the review committees have picked up the general impact factors only to uh, evaluate the research uh, achievement. However, the international uh, uh, yeah, international agreement is now going on like a DORA, San Francisco Declaration of the Research Assessment. They are uh, looking at more about the general research output, including data, software, etc. Those are very much essential component of the scientific research. Those are really important to, focus, to be focused in this context. And there's some part of the, in the world, uh, there's some institutions are changing the system of the employing a scientist and they are picking up open science activities in their uh, promotion or uh, professorship, etc. So they are, we are hoping to have a next step for this kind of the future of the better science. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I was asked to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Helen Glaves from the British Geological Survey in the UK. And, and I actually thought um, that my, um, my profile on Twitter pr pretty much sums up who I am. I studied life as a geoscientist, and in fact, a marine geoscientist. Um, but in recent years, well, you know, 10, 15 years ago now, I kind of moved more into the informatics space. Um, and so I'm currently um, the division president for the European Geosciences Union, Earth Science and Space Informatics. But I also, I have a life. I'm a parent. Uh, I was a single parent for a while, so I very much resonated with one of our previous speakers. Um, I have a husband. Um, he's around here in San Francisco at the moment. Um, but I wanted to focus a little bit on um, 
some of the, the things that I've learned in my role uh, with the British Geological Survey, um, because we're responsible, we're a UK repository for, for data, for geoscience data, and, and actually Marianne Mansar has actually just um, kind of picked up on a number of the themes that I kind of want to re-emphasize um, in my very short presentation here. As we've already heard, um, scientific endeavor is becoming more complex, um, and there is a much more um, requirement for good practice. We've already mentioned the open science paradigm. We're talking about data management planning. We're talking about the need to align ourselves to various policies. So for in, in Europe, for example, we have Inspire, we have a raft of other legislation, which is actually affecting the way that we do science and how we share data. But one of the key things is that as science becomes more complex and we're having to work more on compliance and we're looking more at how do we share our data with other people? How do we deal with that reproducibility crisis that one of my colleagues has just mentioned? Well, we actually have to start thinking about how do we measure the contribution that researchers are making if we're having to work on this compliance, if we're having to work on sharing data? How are we actually looking at how that contribution is made? Now, one of the problems is that we still live in the publish or per perish paradigm. We're still very much focused on assessing the research contribution through how much have people published. And this is still quite a problem. It puts a lot of strain on young researchers they are still required to publish prolific, prolifically in order to justify their employment, in order to progress their career, in order to, to actually secure future funding, to actually continue their work. But as I've mentioned, modern research methods, practices, um, and those particularly associated with the open science agenda, they actually demand that we're putting more and more effort into how we do our research and just not, not just delivering our research. And the problem is that a lot of this doesn't currently, currently form part of our rewards and recognition structure. So we actually need to think about how are we going to quantify those more intangible contributions that researchers are now making. And um, I noticed on Tim's slide actually that he had um, IGSN in the bottom corner. So there are a number of tools and techniques that have been developed to support open science. So Tim mentioned IGSN, which are used for sample, labeling samples. We have DOIs. I'm sure all of you in the room now know what DOIs are for and how we can actually use them. Out of curiosity, how many people in the room currently have an ORCID? Oh, that's, that is so reassuring. Now, ORCIDs actually mean we can actually unambiguously identify researchers, which means we can connect them to the data they produce, the samples, the workflows, the code. And this actually gives us a metric to start quantifying those more intangible contributions that research, researchers are making to science. But here's where the big problem comes. I work for a research organization. We run a repository. And part of what we do is we actually offer training, data science training, to the next generation of researchers, largely doctoral candidates. And they come on our training courses and we teach them about open science. We teach them about using DOIs, getting themselves an ORCID. And one of the biggest problems that we've come upon in recent years, and I'm, I, this makes me quite depressed at times, I'll be honest, that they come and tell me, we've been back to our institu institution, and their senior researchers say, oh, don't waste your time on that kind of thing. So they, their supervisors, excuse me, are continuing to prop up this publish or peri perish paradigm, which is in a way quite difficult because it means these young researchers are being given the tools in order to gain credit for their contribution to research, but then they're actually being discouraged from using them. And so one of the things that I think I kind of want to wrap up my message for you is that 
we've got quite a lot of work to do if we still have young researchers who are being told that actually gaining credit for anything that isn't published in a journal actually isn't worth doing. And that is still a message that some of our research, young researchers are getting is all of these things that they're doing that aren't publishing research papers aren't worth worrying about. So I think we need to get to a point where we place equal value on all of these different research outputs. But fundamentally, we need to change the culture. And it's not just organizations that can change this culture. We need to engage the, re the funders. And in fact, Mariam Sa'an actually mentioned some of the, the funding agencies who can play a role in this. The societies, EGU, AGU, are just two that can play a role in this. But critically, so can academia. But I think when we say academia, I think we're actually talking about the next generation of researchers. If we equip them with the tools and techniques that allow them to get credit for those more intangible outputs, this is how we will change that reward and recognition structure. So ultimately, I think by equipping the next generation of researchers, this is how we will actually move the open science agenda forward and we will finally change the rewards and recognition structure. But I know this is not a particularly popular way of looking at things because there are an awful lot of people who want to continue to prop up the existing metrics for assessing the way that people contribute to research. <laughs> That's me. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kat Gonzalez, and I forgot to put my institution on the slide. Um, you know, not a diss to them, but uh, it's at Stanford, actually, so I made it into the PhD comic. Um, I'm an early career researcher. I'm a PhD candidate at Stanford, um, so that's what my talk today is going to be framed around. Um, yeah, so I first was going to show sort of a newsline narrative uh, demonstrating evidence for the mental health crisis in academia. Starting with my home institution, this is a piece that was published uh, last winter. Um, but as I started taking screenshots, I realized that there was perhaps too much for us to go over here. Um, both opinion pieces, uh, campus pieces, but also peer-reviewed pieces um, demonstrating empirically that there's a crisis. So I leave this to you to um, look up and share if you want to take a picture, write down quickly. I dropped a bunch of links into a Google Doc. Um, these are a lot of articles that have shaped my thinking. Um, so please feel free to look at that. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about a lot of the challenges that face early career researchers so that in our discussion we can move towards action. Um, so these are just, a, this is just a short list of some of the challenges facing grad students and postdocs today. Um, we hear a lot about the challenges on the left column, long work hours, we just talked about this publish or perish paradigm, and all of these factors here are important and contribute to a, a culture of, um, that doesn't support students wellness and postdocs and faculty and administrators, right? So it's cascading up and down academia. Um, a lot of what I work on um, as a student advocate at Stanford, um, mostly against harassment, gender-based harassment, sexual harassment, and also discrimination, bullying, things that have to do with the environment in which we're learning as early career researchers. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that there are many factors that lead to mental illness and that we, we should talk more about them. It's not just that students are working themselves too hard. No, there are things that are out of some students' control. 
um, as far as the aforementioned research environments or institutional culture, or even um, effects like climate change and broader societal things. It's, it's a stressful time to be alive. Um, I also want to acknowledge that some of us have predisposition to mental illness, and we've come with a history of mental illness to graduate school, um, but perhaps there are factors that exacerbate that. So as I've been thinking about these different factors, I'm a climate scientist, so um, if you're not a climate scientist, um, that's okay. But there's this framework that we use to think about risk and hazards and, and exacerbation and, of different hazards, as well as natural cycles and external cycles, right? So, but today I want to focus on the environment and what we can do to make that better. I love this quote here. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And I've been noticing that there's been a lot of rhetoric around early career researchers um, needing to do more self-care and take care of themselves and seek mental health care, which are things that I advocate for, absolutely. Um, but as we're talking about on this panel, for the next centennial, we really need to transform our culture and the environment in which we're bringing up the next generation of scientists. So here's a framework that I offer to you to think about these um, stressors. Um, they're, they're really more than stressors. I don't want to um, devalue them. That a lot of these things happen and they can push our early career scientists out of the science field. And to solve these grand challenges, we want to be cultivating people, not just for their research output, but as a community, as a society that's interacting with inside outside academia. Um, and I also want to highlight that um, there can be intersecting challenges, right? Some folks have increased vulnerability to lack of wellness um, at their institutions, particularly with the issues of discrimination. Um, folks of different identities um, experience an intersecting compounding effect of these issues. And so we really need to be focusing on the margins or those who don't have the normative experience in academia to solve these problems. And so as a climate scientist, we hear a lot about what are we going to do to solve the climate crisis? Um, and likewise, I offer this framework for solving the mental health crisis on our campuses and in academia. That yes, we need empathy, we need to listen to stories, we need to share stories, and that requires being vulnerable at times. Um, but at the end of the day, stories are not enough. We will have to demonstrate courage and action, and this may require rethinking, reimagining some of the structures in academia. Um, and that's gonna take a lot of courage just to go against the norm to go against business as usual, as we say in climate science. Um, so yes, that's my final pitch, is that to solve climate change and other issues, let's change the climate of our institutions. I look forward to our discussion. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Susie Moser, and I feel compelled to make, uh, before I get started my slides, just to make a little bit of a thread. It seems to me we're, we're looking at the stresses of earth science professionals at a number of levels. One is sort of the, whoops, the career um, pathway, if you will, and what might happen from early to later in our career. Some of it is about our research practices. Some of it is about the institutions in which we live. and. Now we're gonna get into a part of this panel that is much more about the substance of what we research and how that in and of itself stresses us as well. So what I wanna introduce you to is, um, very quickly myself, <laughs> um, which is just to say that I'm uh, working in a very strange space. Substantively, I work at the interface between adaptation to climate change, how to communicate climate change, and how to work effectively at the science practice interface. 
institutionally, if you will, I'm a boundary individual in that I don't live in academia and I don't live in the world of practice. I have a foot in each and live at that interface. Um, and what I do in that place is to look for really interesting research questions that practitioners struggle with and then try to build capacity in those communities to work on them and help support finding solutions. Now, having said that, one of the critical issues that practitioners currently struggle with, and the practitioners you're gonna actually hear about on this panel, is talking about climate change to their communities. If they're, say, planners or extension agents or engineers or you name it, sustainability professionals, and they then have to carry that message from all of this amazing research that you produce to people who are experiencing those very effects. They live in the communities affected, they have to cope with what they know from climate science, and then they have to effectively communicate that to people who actually really don't wanna hear what you have to say. So, out of that has come a recognition that these professionals have to deal with constant change, something we as human beings really don't do very well. They have to deal oftentimes and increasingly with traumatic change and increasingly with transformative change. And what I mean by that is that given what we know from climate science, they, we either choose to transform to prevent really profound changes in the Earth system, or it will simply transform us. If we fail to do the former, it will transform us based on what we know. So is this something that a planner, an extension agent, an ecologist learns in graduate school? Have any of you learned about how to deal with all of that? I doubt it. At least none of the people that I know work with have to deal or know how to deal with that from graduate school. Now, this, is, uh, this, this kind of challenge is at least acknowledged as emotional labor that climate scientists have to, uh, have to do for all of us. In this particular paper, which I highly recommend to you, it's the notion of keeping the head, the heart a long way from the brain. In other words, we have to, in order to keep our credibility, put our emotions about what we know um, on the shelf and, and then convey it as if all of that has no implications for us psychologically. But it is not acknowledged yet for the people who work in local communities having to prepare their communities for those impacts. So to help those individuals planners, emergency responders, resilience or sustainability officers, sometimes educators, um, extension agents, as I mentioned, community leaders in general. How do we help those individuals who actually create the very communities in which we live? How do we help them? That's the question that this project started from. So let me say a word about what I mean by the adaptive mind. Basically, it's the idea that you have either the characteristics or the skills or the capabilities of being prepared to deal creatively and flexibly um, and readily to those constant traumatic or transformative challenges before you. Now that's a mouthful. There is essentially a vast amount of research from military psychology to any other flavor of psychology, to trauma work, to Buddhist mindfulness practice, to business change ma management, I mean, you name it. It is all over the place. Very many different disciplines have something to say about it. And part of this project is to actually integrate from all these different disciplines what we mean by an adaptive mind to see what part of that is trainable and then help um, develop training materials to help those individuals that we talk about. Who are our immediate partners and, and audiences? You see on this slide um, the most immediate networks that we're working with, Sea Grant Extension, so people in coastal areas, um, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is another network of 29 reserves around the country, uh, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, the Institute for Sustainable Communities, all of which are basically networks of community leaders who do this kind of work, do adaptation, do sustainability, resilience building in their communities. We're also working very closely with uh, something you probably have never heard about, the National Association of Climate Resilience Planners. It is essentially community-based um, leaders uh, in 
communities of color. Um, I'll be done in one minute. Um, and we have a whole number of advisors uh, very much making issues of justice and equity central to the work that we do because trauma is not a new thing. For some people, it's been going on for hundreds of years. Very quickly, I want to share with you what we've learned so far. We have surveyed these individuals in these networks, and what we have found is that 80% of them say they're burned out. How does this compare to the American uh, public in general? Well, if you add it all together with the Gallup poll ask, 67% in America say that they sometimes or occasionally um, feel um, burnt out. So there is something going on, and we have actually looked into it. Most of the people experience this or have to uh, face these issues in their communications and outreach work, in other words, with the communities they work with. And this is the, probably the most important slide I want to show to you, and what I want to point to in particular is we ask people how many times um, in their daily life, in their work, um, do they experience one of the three things here. I'm emotionally exhausted from the topic I address. Half of the individuals say they feel that at least once a month. If you look at the second column, I work, the work I do is not enough to address climate change. This is something that 90% people feel at least once a month, and many of them daily. And what's the really perfect uh, ingredient for burnout is the next column, which is I am determined to succeed in my work because of what I know about climate change and potential impacts. In other words, they're committed to helping but they feel every day, I cannot rest, I cannot rest because what I do is not enough, right? So between not ever feeling you're doing enough and wanting to help your community succeed, you simply cannot take a day off. That is how we get to burnout. So this project is all geared toward not just advancing the understanding of what an adaptive mind is and what those capacities are, but to develop the resources, the trainings, and a support network to help adaptation professionals, and I think, quite frankly, climate change professionally is more general to work um, forward. So I'll, I'll keep it here and jump off. So thank you very much. Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. I feel very uh, called out, if you will, by Susie, um, because my name is Sarah Watson, and I am the Coastal Climate and Resilience Specialist for South Carolina Sea Grant Consortium and the Carolinas Integrated Sciences and Assessments. Um, I basically work directly with coastal communities in South Carolina, helping them prepare for climate change and sea level rise and other coastal hazards. Um, my talk will be a little bit different um, than the others because I'm going to tell you how I do my job um, and explain what I actually do because I think that a lot of folks um, who um, are not necessarily aware of how people in the boundary work, um, it might be really interesting for you to understand what we do. Um, and so I'm also going to focus a little bit more on the stressors that those of us in climate outreach, communication, and extension face. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the things that I personally do to manage um, my stress. So, um, where's this slide? Just the, uh, just the right arrow. Oh, I should have checked that before I came up. Um, for those of you who don't know what extension is, we are basically a bridge between academia and research to the practical world. Um, we help translate that science that you all are generating, and we help bring it to the people who need to understand how to apply it to the work that they are doing. Um, on the ground, uh, a lot of folks don't necessarily understand what um, an RCP uh, 8.5 scenario truly means. Um, we're there to kind of help explain what that truly means to them on the ground in a way that maybe they would never have understood elsewhere. Um, and so we, connect, we also connect researchers with those who um, may have questions that they need answered in that co-production model. Um, and so my job is actually with two specific NOAA-funded programs, Sea Grant and the Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments. But the extension as model um, as a whole began about 100 years ago with land-grant universities to connect farmers and agriculture to research science that was intended to help agriculture improve. Um, so the vast majority of what my job is, is building relationships and helping people facilitate difficult conversations about the future. 
Um, a big part of it really requires me to get very deep in the weeds of policy and planning and local government, and I'm alongside them, uh, sitting next to them in the room as they're discussing and trying to understand what science means to what kind of decision they're looking at. Um, my job requires not only that I understand the science, um, it also requires me to be able to effectively communicate it in a way that actually matters and uh, is resonant and, and salient to the people that I'm working with. Um, and so I, I know how to have to know how uh, to understand how that uh, all the science is working and how to actually explain that. Um, I also have to know the social science behind so, uh, risk communication and risk perception. Um, and I also have to understand the complex tensions between local policy, uh, local planning, um, and local politics. And, and if you want to know how politics get, the smaller you get, the smaller your jurisdiction is, the bigger the politics usually is. Um, so more concrete examples for what I do is that, you know, for example, I will help planners figure out how to weave climate projections into a comprehensive plan. Um, I will also help them figure out how to apply climate science into long-term policies, such as building codes or other kind of development policies. Um, I will also help town engineers understand how return intervals on a storm might change and how that might affect how they want to do de uh, development standards or stormwater design standards in the future. Uh, because a lot of times when you are developing building codes in this sort of work, it can take 30 to 50 years for that to be fully implemented. So it's, it's challenging to kind of say, all right, well, here's what we expect in 30 to 50 years. But if you're planning now for 30 to 50 years, by the time you get 30 to 50 years in the future, you're going to be behind yourself. So um, it's challenging when you do that because it also means that um, you're trying to also communicate science to people who, one, don't really understand it, two, may not be fully scientifically literate, and three, also may distrust science as, as a whole. So um, it's one thing to kind of say, here's a map illustrating what three feet of sea level rise means. It's completely different when you're saying, well, this is what this map is showing, sea level rise plus tides and plus possible storms. Um, so I also give a lot of talks, uh, public talks uh, in, in South Carolina about sea level rise and climate change. Um, it's primarily in coastal South Carolina where people are, are pretty, uh, they're, they're aware that things are changing. It's, this is not a controversial topic anymore. Um, but lately when I give these presentations, I'm getting the blank stare coming back at my face and it's not a stare of distrust, it's usually a stare of kind of realizing suddenly what climate change means to them. This is often the first time they've truly had that conversation and I'm, I'm looking at them in their eyes when they're having that moment of realization. Um, in a lot of ways, I, I also help people kind of figure out how to soften the fall um, for the future as it's coming in. Um, in a lot of places, we're kind of framing this as buying as much time as possible. Buying time maybe 30 years, maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years. Um, but it's looking at it in that context because there's also stuff that I can't really say to the people that I work with, but we all kind of already know, which is that we can't save everything. And that down the line, we know that there are places where a positive and a just future is very unlikely. Um, that means I spend a lot of time talking about loss, and I have to talk about loss to people who are not necessarily realizing that's what I'm talking about. But I also have to talk about it in a way that leaves them feeling empowered, so that they're feeling like there's, there's something that they can do, that they know what the next step for them can be. Um, so we are struggling locally with how to have that conversation, where I th as I think everybody else is struggling with that conversation. And we're also struggling about when is the right time for it. So this work is intense. Um, at times, it is very emotionally draining. It is also incredibly fulfilling because I feel like I have the opportunity to help people uh, make a real difference in areas where perhaps they would never have had that opportunity. Um, but at the same time, I also live where I work. Um, I live with the disruption. I live with uh, multiple weeks of, of tidal flooding, um, which can disrupt my commute, just like everybody else's. Um, I talk to my neighbors and my friends about this. I see it literally in my backyard. Um, I have to evacuate for hurricanes. Um, and I also worry about my car corroding due to saltwater exposure. Um, and then I also have people who know because of what my job is, they come up to me privately and ask me how do I handle things emotionally because they are struggling with how to manage their feelings. Um, and the added challenge in all of this is, you know, we, we talk about that heart-mind uh, distance for, for science. 
I too have to have that distance when I walk into a room. I have to remain as emotionally neutral as possible because I can't unduly influence those uh, people's ideas or, or in, um, their, um, their plans for you know, either their feelings or their emotions or their decisions. Um, this is an essential professional boundary for me um, because my job is there to be a communicator, a translator, and a facilitator. I don't tell people what to do. And even if I had that responsibility, the more that I learn, the less I know. You know that how that always goes. But it's also that it's not my community and it's not my space necessarily to say, I think I know what your decisions should be because I really and truly don't know. So um, I have a lot of days where I struggle with this, um, where especially if I'm thinking deeply about some of the, the things that I've just learned or I'm understanding something in a whole new way. Um, sometimes I'm kind of grumpy and overwhelmed. Um, sometimes I just cannot handle any more bad news, and so that's when I have to tune out all social media and all media in general. Um, and some days I kind of get caught up in the future mentally, and I struggle staying in the present. Um, so how do I cope with this job stress? Um, a lot of this is going to sound familiar. I will tell you that sometimes it's not enough, and it's a daily practice. Um, so not think I have it completely figured out. I don't, um, probably like everybody else in the room. Um, but a lot of this is also going to sound familiar because it's what a lot of experts recommend, and that is taking good care of yourself. Um, that's eating well, sleeping well, prioritizing sleep for me is really important, making sure I exercise, making sure I talk to my friends and take emotional breaks from my work, and so that I'm making sure that I'm laughing and enjoying myself and experiencing as much of life as I can. Um, and also spreading time in nature is really helpful and enjoying my hobbies. But most importantly with this, it's learning to say no. Um, even though some, I would love to do everything and all of it's amazing and all of it is interesting and look, would, amazing, would look amazing on my CV, sometimes I have to prioritize myself first. Um, and so, um, but the biggest thing for me has been opening up with my trusted colleagues and forming internal and informal uh, support groups and, and uh, discussion groups. And, and that has really given me an opportunity to to talk to people and, and have them listen to what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking, and also for them to do the same. And so that ends up helping for all of us in these groups take the, the struggle out of what we're feeling and also make sure we're not feeling like we're alone. Um, I also write regularly using um, what I refer, it's called a free writing, uh, free writing for, um, uh, type of writing. Um, if you Google it, you'll kind of understand a little bit more of what that is. But I've been doing that actually since I was about 10, so it's kind of nice to still use that and as a method. And so that's really forcing myself to download my brain regularly so that I can move on and fill it up with more stuff. Um, but really, um, my preferred and, and most reliable coping mechanism is humor, um, especially with, with cat pictures, uh, hurricane memes, and really bad Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Last up is Faith. Hi, everyone. Um, whoops. Here we are. Okay. Um, so, hi, I'm Faith Kearns. Um, I'm a scientist and a science communicator with the California Institute for Water Resources, which is housed in the University of California um, system. So, like Sarah, I also work in extension. Um, and I think it can be hard for people who aren't familiar with, um, the cooper with cooperative extension to really understand sort of how grounded and embodied um, that work is. Uh, I'd say extension folks are just sort of not really sequestered in a lab far from the impact of the work that we do. Um, in fact, we live in the same communities that we work in and, and with, um, as Sarah spoke to very eloquently. Um, and therefore, these kind of issues of shared experience and direct responsibility and accountability um, to individuals and communities are very real uh, in the kind of work that I do. Um, and um, that reality is compounded by the fact that I work on some of the most emotional, contentious, and traumatic um, issues in the state of California. Water and drought, wildfire, climate change on working lands in particular. Um, 
and all of these issues um, major intersect with other major challenges that we have in the state, like racism, um, housing, and wealth inequality. And so therefore, it's, it's really difficult for me to sort of be able to think about my own well-being as separate from any other person living in this state. Um, there really is, for me, no us and them, um, no general public. Um, there just isn't. And so um, my well-being is really connected to the well-being of all. And so this connection um, can really sometimes feel like a weighty responsibility. Um, I think Sarah's speaking to as well. Um, but it's also this really interesting potential um, place for insight, um, sort of in the same way that a, a successful therapy relationship might be transformative for the people that are involved in it. Um, however, there's also often a lot of turbulence that kind of can accompany that, that kind of change. So. Um, it is kind of at best challenging, and at worst, it can kind of be actively harmful if it's not handled um, skillfully. So um, the other thing that's really challenging is that when you work in this very embodied way, <laughs> um, the um, you have very little uh, inter, uh, very little boundary between power dynamics and authority, um, and um, yeah, so. Um, at the same time, uh, this is kind of the only way I know how to work. <laughs> I've been doing, I've been working this way for my entire career. Um, and that has meant that I have spent decades kind of cultivating my own personal practices, habits, skills, um, and tools to do this way, work in a way that protects my own well being. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't have bad days, I definitely do. Um, but I have managed to cobble together what works for me as an individual. But the thing that has gotten more and more interesting to me over time um, is kind of what models that we might look at um, that make this kind of deeply engaged work on really difficult issues more sustainable for everybody involved, right? This isn't just a matter of my well-being, but other people's as well. And so instead of advocating for anyone, I just want to put forward a set of things, right? So a lot of what we've been talking about today has been around the sort of more around the idea of individual capacity building. So um, the idea that um, you know, personal understanding and capacity are what's really cr important. And, and I agree that those things are absolutely crucial. Um, and I think the, the next question with that is then sort of where do, where do issues around um, our own individual well-being and navigating this work then intersect with sort of the community level of well-being? Um, and so, um, a, a re one, one thing that's really challenging, I think, about that individual model is that we can all get really skilled up on sort of dealing with things that might generally fall into, say, a trauma bucket or a conflict bucket. Um, I certainly have done a lot of that work myself. Um, and then, uh, and then what? <laughs> um, when you have a, you know several wildfires every year and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and one of the big questions that happened for me that was really interesting was reading an article about. Um, how sort of this level of trauma is playing out in, in K through 12 schooling and reading about the fact that teachers who've been trained in trauma uh, informed methodologies um, have actually ended up opening up a giant tsunami of other issues. So once kind of the door gets opened, um, students need kind of pours forth in a way that is then really again overwhelming for teachers. Uh, so that's that's really an interesting um, dilemma, I think. So another model that I might put forward is just the idea that that um, scientists, the science communicate community partners more clearly, uh, more formally with mental health and other sort of appropriate practitioners. That's certainly work that I have tried to pilot um, in my own work, and I think it's it can be a really great model. Um, and finally, um, I'm actually pretty inspired by some work uh, that the San Francisco Public Library ended up doing, where they brought an in-house social worker into their into their office because people were showing up at the library um, because it does offer so many resources that um, librarians were getting really overwhelmed by the amount of sort of both just uh, technical need and logical need that people had, and so um, instead of 
uh, asking librarians continue to do this work they were not trained for um, and don't have the capacity to do. They just brought somebody in who could do that work. Um, and, and so um, I think that these kinds of things are the things that professional societies like AGU can assist with thinking through if they choose to. Um, I think, you know, just based on my own, um, my own experience, I would say the more that we can make the kind of care work that needs to happen um, a collective responsibility um, instead of an individual one, the, be the better off we'll all be. And so for me, my guiding questions are really around kind of what does ethical, responsible um, connection and care look like for all of us, not just for ourselves, but also for the people that we work with and serve. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for your thoughts. Now we're going to have our panel discussion, so I want to welcome up Brandon Jones, who's going to moderate our panel. Uh, if you have any questions for the panel, please write them on the index cards provided. And uh, where are those index cards, Shelley? They're, they're, they're all around. OK, find an index card near, nearby. Please write a question on it and pass it to Shelley, who's right here. And we will pass them on to Brandon. We'll try to get to as many as, as we can. Probably not too many, but we'll do our best. And uh, here's Brandon. Thank you. I want to say thank you to Daniel and, and Shelley for inviting me to moderate. I am um, uh, just sitting here thinking about a, a, a recent book that I just completed. Um, the title is Toxic Ivory Towers by uh, Ruth Zambrana. She's at the University of Maryland, uh, social scientist. But her focus is uh, in the book is on faculty of color, but there's so much uh, in the book that relates to many of the things that I heard the panelists say today. And so there's a lot of uh, discussion. And, and, and this book was recommended to uh, NSF leadership from the National Science Board. So they were, I mean, so there, there's a lot of high level uh, understanding that well being um, in academia and just uh, for humans in general um, is, is uh, something we're going to have to pay attention to. I have lots of questions here, uh, and I had lots of comments, and I know we, uh, we, we may have some from the audience already, I think. So I'm just going to jump right in and uh, pose questions. I may call out different panelists to, to start us off in the discussion, but I do want to start with Faith. I'm, you went last, but I want to uh, come back to this partnership, the importance of this partnership issue, and bringing in appropriate expertise that scientists often don't know they need or think they need, because when we're dealing with well-being, it's, uh, it's a people issue, it's not a science issue. Right. And scientists often try to approach it from a scientific uh, perspective and method, yeah. although so do social scientists. But <laughs> um, you know, a geologist you know, that doesn't have that skill. So could you speak more to the importance of partnerships with the right ex uh, right experts? Um, sure. So I, you know, I myself am an, a very psychologically minded person. I've done a lot, a lot of work. I have a lot of skills. Um, and the need in the state of California is incredibly overwhelming. And so for the science community to think that um, we can sort of interface with the need that's out there um, by ourselves <laughs> is is um, yeah uh, it it even just on scale it doesn't work so I think for example of you know just um, I work on fire in California and things that we've seen be successful is um, there you know after a big wildfire event there will be collectives of therapists um, and various kinds of mental health workers I should say um, who. Um, provide you know some level of care for six months or a year after a large fire. Um, I think those kinds of things could be activated in advance and sort of more closely coordinated, especially in a state like California. We know we're going to have more big fires. Um, it's a it's a yearly event. They will happen again. So planning would be great. Um, I also have. Um, uh, started work on a, a MOU with a um, with Saybrook University, which is a, um, a psychological training school, where you know the idea would be both for uh, people in cooperative extension to have access to some of the courses that they teach, mm -hmm. as well as for um, students uh, to students at their school to potentially be able to work um, for part of their project work with people who have needs in our. Um, 
in our cooperative extension unit, particularly as it relates to fire, but other issues. So um, those are just a couple of examples. Sure. So, yeah, I was going to say one, uh, another panelist to comment on that. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Susan. Yeah, I'd love to add something to it. Um, I've been, as in part because of the project that I introduced you to, I've been um, in touch frequently with uh, representatives from psychiatry or the American uh, Psychologists Association, Counseling Association. And what's interesting there and important to recognize is there is a small handful of psychologists that already gets this and a vast number of psychologists who are just as ignorant about climate change as anybody else in the country. They simply are not yet at the point of recognizing not only is this a big problem that their clientele might bring in, it's a problem that affects them themselves. <laughs> they too live in the very communities that are affected by fire and by floods and by whatever, right? So whether or not they get the existential nature and have worked that through enough to be able to support their clients with appropriate things, I get asked more than you know once a week probably by people who trust me do you know a therapist who I don't have to explain climate change to, wow. to before I can wow. get treatment? That is the level of challenge wow. that they're facing. So I'm you know, trying to build a partnership with the APA to kind of build so that they don't start to come up with you know, their approaches completely mm -hmm. independent mm -hmm. of working mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. affected population. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really important piece of building these partnerships. That capacity needs to be built in the uh, service provision side as well. Right. So th th good point. So so Yashiro, did I say your name correctly? Uh, uh, <laughs> what, anyway, I, I want to come to you because you, and, and related to these last two comments, because you talked about co-production, co-design, yeah. and, and what we're talking about early career faculty who maybe are already bent to service learning. They understand that they want their science to be more applied. They may not have the skills to deal with uh, the, the trauma that's related to the communities that they are working with. So as we heard, uh, well, I'll ask you how, comments on uh, connecting to those communities that have the skills that we would need in that co-production, co-design context. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, still, it's, uh, I think it is, it's a question not easy to answer. Yeah. And uh, mm, yeah, actually, so as far as I know, in a, in, even in a international scenes, uh, uh, yeah. co-design, co-production uh, approach can make uh, concrete processes how science scientists can work with the societal stakeholders and students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are struggling with you know, mm. the more better way, smart way to work together with the citizen or other societal stakeholders. And uh, uh, right now, we are now under the development of the more literacy in a scientist side and the citizen literacy. side. Okay. Yeah, we mm -hmm. need to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, each other. Mm -hmm. Scientists need to how the society yep. move in which way, and the citizen or societal or policy maker needs to understand what the scientists can do or what the, what the scientists can make a, what kind of a flower. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So the uh, it's uh, we need to do so uh, question finding mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. I and Erica, I was going to come to you because you mentioned, you hinted at this bias that traditional scientists have uh, with social scientists and this. Uh, so comment on that. Implicit bias. There we go. Yes, uh, it exists. Um, when I was a former program director, we did uh, monitor that within the review process. Uh, they would say, um, you know, geologists and them. Or, you know, there was always a phrase that encompassed everyone who was not an earth scientist or a physical scientist, but was still a scientist. Mm -hmm. And we would watch for that. And we would make sure that that did not enter the record. Mm -hmm. And the same would happen for gender and, um, 
you know, other uh, dismissive terms that people really are not aware that they are being dismissive when they're saying that. Um, so we would try to educate in that process. But I want to pull this into something that um, we're developing. The word society has been used here. Um, you referenced the need for societies. You know, we're sitting in the AGU society. Uh, but did you realize that there is no professional society targeting sustainability? That we don't, you know, we have six or seven for artificial intelligence or nanotechnology. How long has sustainability and resilience been around? You know, at least 20 years. And we don't recognize it as a professional endeavor. So, um, you know, thinking about society writ large, but society in a professional sense. So we're <coughs> launching that um, in 2020 at the Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress, the idea that we need to build a community. And, and that community may not just be in, you know, climate science or in earth science, but it's about knowledge. It's about threading together those streams necessary to actually achieve it and the recognition that sustainability is not something that academia owns. It is something, it is a human condition that we are trying to achieve, a planetary condition. So hopefully by creating a structure that brings people together around that endeavor, we might be able to lift each other up to connect, to build a common language that makes us feel less alone and less um, isolated and also enables us to change those structures that are preventing the kind of transformation we need to build future careers. And also just to come back to the idea of implicit bias, the idea that a scientist that is not in a university is not a scientist. Um, I struggle with that myself. I, had a, I have a PhD in oceanography. I do not practice oceanography currently. Does that make me not a scientist? Does that, did I give up my card when I became a program director? Are my views no longer valid when it comes to sustainability or climate change? So just having a little bit of empathy and understanding and building a community where we all have a role to play in a future that we want to build together. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Tim, I'm going to come to you after this comment. Uh, so I, I, too, program director, background in ocean sciences, uh, more biology than, than geo. Uh, but that I resonated you know, with that. Uh, and, and I will tell you, and I probably most of you would appreciate this, that you want your colleagues uh, at the PhD level to be in the agencies, particularly now. I have to, I'll be careful, because um, that's my boss. So, um, but, but, but Tim, related to that, uh, what structure, what, how, how do we communicate to decision makers? <laughs> that uh, may be supporting, as you were getting at in some of your slides, those barriers, uh, not just supporting, maybe just actually creating and raising them, uh, that would inhibit us from partnering with uh, the individuals we need to partner with and move forward sustainably, et cetera, et cetera. Could you comment on that? Yeah, look, I mean, that's the challenge, isn't it? And um, I think the challenge in Australia, and I'm, I'm sure, as I've sort of mentioned, we're not alone in this, is the huge polarization in views that's happened over the last few years and the divide that just seems to be growing more and more and becoming more and more emotional and that's what I struggle with. So in Australia it seems like there's, there's this desire um, to have this respectful discussion about these issues uh, but there's also like this politics of greed, which kind of overrides that. And, and it's really hard to know how to deal with that. Um, so, you know, the point I was trying to make is that I don't think we should have to, you know, ideally I think our research and the points that we're trying to make about how the planet's changing should speak for themselves. But I think somehow we need to, to try to remove 
remove any emotion that we put into those statements from them just so that the science and the data that underpins that science can stand alone. And I think you can find politicians and policy makers that want to have a conversation at that level and don't want to be, um, you know, that don't want to make it emotional, want to talk about the the change that we're observing mm -hmm. and what it means to them. Mm -hmm. And they are really trying to make informed policy based on that, that real data. On so I think it, it's a matter of finding those people that are open to that conversation. So Katerina, Tim said something about emotion. You had several articles up there about uh, early career faculty and others have dealing with their emotions uh, from all the stress related uh, to academia and such. Uh, how important is it for us to have those safe spaces where we can yell and scream and holler and vent and drop deaf bomb and such, and then uh, come into the decision-making uh, meeting and maintain our composure to, to get the point across? You know, mm -hmm. could you speak to? Yeah, I think this is a an important point. Just that that heart mind divide, mm. and and when should it be? Um, integrated and when should it be separated and so when when communicating with society I know many of my colleagues have more expertise and opinions on that in a educational space really I, I tend to be of the opinion that we don't engage our emotions that much and that we should be whether that's at the boxing gym or that's in an empathetic conversation with trusted colleagues whom you're not, um, who you don't have a power dynamic over, where, where it's, where it's mm -hmm. safe to be yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. I, tend, I tend to be of the opinion that we, we should strive to bring more of ourselves to um, our places of learning and our places of work, um, but also like if, if we have, um, if we're having issues managing those emotions, we should also, we should work on ourselves. If it's financially available to us, we should go to therapy and deal with our demons from graduate school so that we're not taking it out on policymakers, students and stuff, but at the same time so we can show up more present that I can take a student or peer out to coffee and really be present with them and say, yes, I know what you're going through and I'm not going to prescribe my um, opinion on you, but I can empathize with them um, and, and be more, more human in, in that way. Especially, there's just this dominant narrative that a scientist is um, supposed to be objective and, and is objective and that's, um, there are, there's a time and space to be objective, absolutely. Um, but I think in educational spaces, we should, we should work more on our integrating ourselves. So Helen, related to that, uh, you talked about the, the valuation systems in academia, what's valued, what's not, what's the currency, what, what isn't. Uh, so let's say, for instance, uh, a faculty member at a tribal college who has five teaching, you know, heavy teaching load, not a lot of grant infrastructure support, stressed from the academic side, from the research side, their culture, et cetera, and this need to uh, provide support to their students uh, and maintain fidelity to their tribe or their band or what have you. Could you speak to, so to this emotional piece and, and where to vent or how to vent with a, a faculty member that may not be able to access that area to... Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably should say that, that I don't come from an academia background. Mm -hmm. I, I work for a, a research organization in the right, UK. Right. And, and in, but I do, I do have a lot of crossover with, with, as I mentioned, I have a lot of contact with particularly PhD students mm -hmm. at the moment. And, and I think there are a number of threads here about how we can support that emotional well-being and make sure there are safe spaces yeah. to be able to, yeah. to, to have those exchanges, but they have to be safe spaces. Now, for example, um, I think there's a strong role to play for mentoring. Um, both AGU and EGU, for example, run mentoring schemes where more, you know, 
mid-career scientists can have that conversation with early career researchers, students, and if they build up quite a, a strong relationship so that they feel comfortable, I think that's, that's a, a really beneficial relationship and a space where there can be a conversation where the early career researcher can perhaps benefit from the experience from somebody who's perhaps been through some of these things in the past and understands how best to channel some of these emotions mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. they don't become detrimental to their career. Mm -hmm. And certainly within my own organization, we have a number of welfare mechanisms where depending on how you feel you want to deal with particular challenges, you can actually speak to people in different ways, in different capacities. And I think that's quite important to feel that you can speak to appropriate people mm -hmm. and that it isn't going to jeopardize your career. Because I, I certainly in the space that I've worked in in the past, I've had conversations with colleagues who've worked for me who've said, oh, I don't want people to know that I suffer from depression mm -hmm. because it might prevent me getting the promotion. It might prevent me getting a leadership role. So I think knowing where you can have those conversations without feeling that it can jeopardize your career for the future, yeah. I think that's really valuable. That's, that's excellent. Um, those, so there was mention about the power structure oftentimes and whether it's, you know, supervisors or advisors or what have committee members and uh, we're talking about well-being of individuals that are being socialized into a system or trained into a system. Um, and, and so this notion of, I don't want anyone to know, uh, but then how many of us know deans or chairs or vice provosts that <laughs> the fruit is there, right? Um, uh, so uh, Sarah, I'm going to come to you and then we have a couple of questions from the audience and then we'll, I think we have time maybe to go back through. Uh, so Helen brought up the, I, this, this issue of mentorship and how important it is. And one level of mentoring that I've found in my career that's really important is peer mentoring. Mm -hmm. to, to have a cohort of individuals that I can just, I come to AGU, I do my thing, and then in the evening we're somewhere acting up, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but, and, it, and it, it helps, and it helps maintain that balance. So given the extension work that you're in and the, I mean, I felt the, the, inner, the, the emotional energy that you, when you were up here speaking about dealing with the communities and, and how much drain that is on you. Um, allies, how important is it to you in your work to have allies and, and near, or you know, peer mentors that, that can help support you in what you do? Well, I'm sitting between two of them. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you that when I first started my job, I was not at all prepared for what it would actually mean to me emotionally, and so I was not doing too well. And um, thankfully, I had some people kind of ask that really important question, and so that's a really important thing to, if you're somebody who's in, you know, in a position of, you know, not necessarily power, but definitely observation. If you see somebody that's struggling and you know that they can possibly trust you, ask the question. Um, and then as you begin that, that journey of, of asking the question and, and potentially um, building that relationship, um, that's a really important thing to have that conversation and have those people that you can go to. Um, Faith and I met on Twitter two years ago and we talked to each other probably once a month for at least an hour and a half. <laughs> we don't have short calls. Um, but, you know, I, we've also formed um, an informal group of, of people who um, various disciplines but also um, struggle with some of the same issues. And we've, we, we've become, we really need to meet more often um, because we, we'll, we really enjoy our talks with each other. But it's multidisciplinary, um, multiple different levels of expertise. and. We learn from each other, and we just um, having that opportunity to share with with everybody else. I find that I'm a very private person. I know that you're all shocked to hear that, um, but I generally don't like to have my peer networks within you know people that I work with in my office. I need that distance and that space because 
you know, you're always afraid of that. A little bit of, hmm, could that get out somewhere or mm -hmm. could that spread mm -hmm. somewhere that I don't really want it to or could I get misinterpreted? So I find that it's safer for me to have those peer networks outside of my office and within my immediate employment networks. Um, but I also know other um, extension groups that, that actually work within the office and talk to each other and have much tighter relationships. And so it ends up really kind of, um, you know, one, very important to have those outlets, but two, work with what works for you. Don't try to force yourself to fit any kind of um, model that you think doesn't quite fit you perfectly. So that's an excellent segue to some of the questions that we just received from the audience. Uh, one in particular is asking about uh, specific issues related to the culture change that needs to occur in the system, not the individual, but the system. And uh, Which uh, system? Can you whatever system. Right? So the work system, the academic system, it, it, yeah. Um, at, so it's outside of the individual. What the indiv there's what the individual needs to do, but then there, there are just barriers that are external. Okay. So the specific question is beyond individual practice, is there specific culture change that is needed for objective quantitative physical, uh, objective quantitative physical scientists to practice empathy? So it's about um, specific areas within the culture where scientists can learn to practice empathy. And I think, Katerina, that was kind of getting to what you were commenting yeah. on. So. Yeah, empathy was my first bullet, but anyone who knows me knows that I'm about big systemic change. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's when, when you talk about culture, an institution really is a collection of individuals, right? So how do we motivate human behavior, behavior to move towards one more of empathy, more of action? Um, and and we, I think we've talked about it in bits and pieces um, a lot, and I think Reforming the reward structure is huge. Mm. I think we need to incentivize <clears throat> leaders, whether in the ivory tower or in our workspaces, to um, develop their mentoring abilities, to um, go to workshops on how to cultivate healthy labs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because as we have it, if the reward structure is set up to produce H indices and you know, not get recognized for other important labor, then, then you have a system that's sort of marginalizing good mentoring, good teaching, good community building, good um, advocacy, et cetera. And we need all those people at their best and to be rewarded into moving all of us into where basically what fits us both all, right? We all can't be, uh, we can't do everything right? We don't want to burn our community out, but we need allies to move towards action. And if we want to make that happen quick, we'll have to change the reward structure. So open mic on the system issue. I, um, yeah. Erica and then whoever else. So at an institutional level, um, we, when I, I'm former NSF program officer, we would try to change the culture of the university system. And uh, one of my colleagues referred to it as trying to drive a cruise ship. Um, it was just mm -hmm. such an enormous, slow-moving sort of beast. And so the NSF policy was, if you want to herd cats, you move the food bowl. So we would make a very large, award available yeah. that was supposed to instigate cultural change, um, change the reward structure, sh change the university um, dynamic entirely. But as soon as the food bowl is empty, we kind of that cruise ship steers back to where it wants to be. So that is a challenge. Um, more recently, my colleague Judith Nvari in the um, in the audience reflected on a new model, the carrot flavored stick. <laughs> so <laughs> you can't just put the, the food bowl out there. You have to have something that's you know keeping them coming to the food bowl as well. And I think that's the model that we're working on now is uh, we want to reward you, but we also kind of want to have uh, an extra incentive if you don't um, 
keep to the program. So I, I think what we're, we're trying to do with Belmont Forum, and uh, we have seen the, the uh, outcomes, the ripples, I would say, uh, particularly with open data. So, you know, kind of boldly set forth and said, every project we fund is going to be open data, open access. And if you partner with us and you don't have that as a policy, guess what? When you partner with us, you do. And you get to sort of try it out with us. It's a little sandbox to play in and see if you like it. Um, but we are going to hold you to this. And because you're partnering with us, you're going to benefit because you're leveraging money from other places. So that's your carrot and here's our stick. And um, what's happened is it has influenced policy organizations, funders, countries that did not have national open data policies do now. You know, they've learned from the experience and they've made that change. We're seeing it with sustainability. There are sustainability degree programs now in Europe. It's thriving. The U.S. is hopefully trying to catch up. I don't know. But it is rippling. It's happening. And so um, I hope, you know, next year when we have this SRI Congress in Brisbane, we are going to have the availability of space for those programs who are trying to, you know, revolutionize, transform, give them the opportunity to really shine and to draw the students and get the attention and see where that takes us in terms of, you know, um, changing culture, um, a little bit at a time, moving that cruise ship to the port we want it to be in. Susan? Yeah, I just wanted to maybe ask you all in the audience, how many of you, if you had, say, an emotional unwell-being issue, would go to your HR department? Raise your hand. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad none of you are gonna go there because it wouldn't be any help, right? Our HR departments are there to prevent an organization from getting lawsuits. They're not there to help you get well when you need it. <laughs> so how does that ever even change? How do you actually get anybody to pay attention to it? Well, I'm hoping I will never have to experience the day when the first adaptation professional kills him or herself, that will get the HR de department's attention. Right? Because then all of a sudden, well-being becomes a liability. And then somebody will pay attention. Until that happens, until it becomes a legal issue, a financial liability issue, it is a leadership issue. And in my experience, building the case and building the network for the Adaptive Mind Project, I am working with some of the highest leaders in NOAA, because we are involving Sea Grant and the NEARS project um, network in our um, work, and have found a leader in NOAA at a very high level who is thrilled by this project. And the first thing this person said to me is, bring me the data. Why? Because unless I can show there is a problem, I will never garner the attention of their superior to basically put any resources toward it. So, you know, maybe we have to kind of work with the culture in which we live, which is a data-driven, science-driven, evidence-driven culture. So let's bring the data that this is a problem and that certain interventions help, and then you can actually get or garner with that evidence to support in the leadership. But it takes someone to actually say, yes, this is important. I'm going to take the flag and make it happen. It won't happen. I mean, all of the stuff that Erica's talking about happens because Erica's talk, doing it. Right, so it, it, it takes someone, and your work, I mean, it, it takes someone to take the leadership poll to, to do it. Um, Helen, and then uh, Tim, back to the separation of research and data to, to, to that point, but, but Helen. Yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to um, highlight the fact that I think there's another facet to that, and I don't know whether this is a, a, a regional thing, but certainly I'm aware that organizations in Europe we're, we, we're getting an increasing awareness of a duty of care 
to people in the workforce. So, for example, within my own organization in recent years, we now have a confidential welfare structure. So, yeah, you wouldn't go to HR, but you might actually self-refer to somebody and have a <coughs> private conversation with a welfare officer, and they will help you, they will guide you through what are the next steps that I need to take to protect my own well-being, which might be, have you considered taking professional health care advice? Have you considered discussing this with a relative? But it's the whole of that structure has been put in place because there's an increasing well, um, awareness mm -hmm. in the organization that they have a duty of care to their employees as well. Where did that pressure come from? How did it? So I think that pressure came from the need, well, in all honesty, I think it was about um, trying to minimize the number of sick days people were taking <laughs> and understanding. Back to Susie's current yeah. 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 operate in yeah. the system. Okay. But it is understanding yeah. how can we best look after our people so that they don't feel the need to go, actually, I'm just going to take a day off because I'm not really sick, but I don't feel like interacting with the people I work <laughs> with or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's trying to develop that framework that it maybe helps people to deal with whatever the stresses are in their work environment. So I think there is an, a greater in, an awareness coming from top down and whether the drivers are the right ones right, necessarily, right, right. They're, they're actually having yeah. a positive feedback, yeah. you know, in that people do feel there's someone that they can go and talk to yeah. in their work environment to say, hey, this is happening and I need to have somebody to help me guide me through this yeah. without everybody in the department knowing, for example. And I think that that is important to people's well-being in their professional environment, yeah. whatever their field, actually. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, Tim, I'm going to come to you, but th thank you for mentioning uh, whatever the drivers are. I, I, I want people to do it because mm. they align with the reason I want to do it, you know, and uh, that's it, the, the bigger picture is did it get done, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and have to uh, figure out ways to separate what I want and what should be done and however people get to that point to, to start to move change along, certainly. So, uh, Tim, that, that separation piece uh, that... I think relates to this. Yeah, look, I think it, it was good that Susie brought up the data and how important that is. And I think it is part of this systematic change that's required. So to my mind, um, the data is, is, is the pure thing, right? And, you know, if we collect metadata and we collect data and we show the process by which that data was collected, virtually no one can, can argue with that data. So, so the data, whatever, whether it's about, you know, our, emotional well-being or whether it's about climate change or whether it's about impact of fracking or whatever, um, the data has a purity about it so long as there was a process put in place mm -hmm. around how it was collected. So, so for me, again, it becomes this, this how do we change the organisations that we work in so that when we put out a data set, it carries as much weight as a publication. I think that that's where we need to get to. Um, or, you know, ideally it carries more weight. If you're putting out some data, that's something that's going to live forever, right? Mm -hmm. Science changes. We move on. We build on each other's ideas. But the, the data will be there forever. So I think that that's the fundamental thing we need to change. And no matter what is driving somebody's position on any of these very emotional issues that we're trying to put science behind to, to you know, to constrain, if you like, um, if you present them with a data set that's unambiguous, then it's much harder for them to, to take a, an emotional position or to, to use your emotional position against you to try to, to um, mm -hmm. you know, right. undermine your argument. So for me, I, look, I, I'm a bit torn by this. Like some of the stuff that's coming out of my mouth, I kind of believe, but I kind of don't believe at the same <laughs> time. You know what I mean? Like I'm sort of making a counter argument in my own head as I'm saying this stuff. <laughs> So mm -hmm. I think it's really hard. I think it's really hard yeah. to find the, the right way to present ourselves. You know, we are emotional people. I'm telling myself that I shouldn't be emotional when I'm talking to politicians, but at the same time, I want to, you know, grab them by the collars yeah. and shake them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. telling story. Uh, Yashihiro and, and then Susie, and then uh, we have about maybe nine minutes. Uh, so after those two comments, I'll, we'll just kind of okay. yeah. open it up for... 
Yeah, uh, please let me just add a comment on that data issue. Uh, that's in a, yeah, I, I just remember that some young associate professor in a university uh, complains of that his data management work is ne not recognized in the faculty and uh, uh, he is under the pressure that he has to uh, work out for the uh, curating the data set from the space mission, et cetera. And the, but he is evaluated through his journal article publication. And uh, yeah, that, that kind of the uh, gaps of the uh, scientists follow the norms of the scientific community and organization uh, follow the legislation and regulation. That is a really big gap. And the, mm. this kind of the uh, 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 improvement makes them more uh, free from the uh, pressure. From the, the, from the yeah. pressure. And that, yeah. so, Susie? I guess I'm, I'm glad to hear Tim beginning to self-correct a little bit, so I, I don't have to say everything that I wanted to say about it, but I have a strong reaction, and I just want to make, make sure that you know, we actually acknowledge that. Data are not just objective things. I'm sorry. I grew up with, um, in geography training with a book called How to Lie with Maps. Maps is just another form of, of data, right? So I just want to you know, say we make very strong selections, emotionally value-driven selections, what we do collect data on and what we don't collect data on. So the vast gaps of things that you never see in any book or data, databases or whatever, is very important just as much as that's what we do gather. So that's the first one. And the other thing is that I don't think the goal is for all of us scientists to go in a corner, you know, whatever, insulated, and we can just bang against the walls and have our emotions and then come back out and have, be emotionless. I think the goal is for us to acknowledge that we are whole human beings with a mind, this part of the brain and that part of the brain, and they actually work better together. That is design, decision science, right? So if you want to be convinced of that, then read some decision science that you make better decisions when the left and the right brain, when the front and the back work together well. So it's really important for us to understand that you know it's not the goal to be emotionless. It is, in my mind, the goal that we are competent in doing really good science and in integrating our humanity in what we do, because that is the challenge we're facing. And, uh, Katerina, and, no, thank you for, for, for that comment. Uh, we may we being that this is the royal we swinging way over to let's be emotionless because we see so much just mm -hmm. gut decision making and, but i hear you the the goal we're, we're trying to bring it back um, into some balance where well, it just as you well mentioned be a reaction that's what to i the mean the fact that we have ignored our emotions for so long right there you go yeah so then yeah. we insist on them ever so loudly yeah on that part too yeah thank you Kind yeah, absolutely. I just want to segue from there. Absolutely. When we're educating, even about science, joy, passion are very integral to doing science. And when we're trying to make change, anger, frustration, things that are negative emotions, they're valid and they're useful. And we should bring those to the table too. So thank you, Susie. And then also, I do want to like advocate for collecting data about the climate of our workspaces. Um, specifically, we can do this, we can show leadership at whatever level you're at. So if you're a dean or a department head or a chair, consider putting forth an uh, initiative, maybe five years, three years, that collects data on the well-being of everyone in your school and then see what works, right? Um, so even students can lead these climate surveys. So just a quick plug for that. But at the end of the day, also too, people aren't just numbers. If someone's dropping out, like they're they're a person. Why did they why did they drop out? Why did they take a leave of absence? Who's thriving and why? Um, I want to just share a really quick example from some of the work I've done around sexual harassment in our academic spaces. Is that there are awesome uh, reports, particularly the NASM report on the sexual harassment of women. They document it very well. But when talking with decision makers in my institution, the most compelling thing are stories. And then also to the previous points, yes, like data tell stories. 
but they, the data don't always speak for themselves. There's always a slant. And when we have issues of well-being and mental illness that are often um, marginalized or there's a stigma, then those stories won't ever speak. So let's ask, like, who's controlling the narrative? And can we give the mic back to those who maybe don't have a voice? So my colleagues and I designed an, an event um, called Hashtag Stanford 2, and we collected anonymous stories of harassment. And those will live on even after I graduate, after um, doing all this. Those will live on, and, and hopefully change can happen slowly over time. Um, but, you know, if, if a person is struggling every day, you know, we're not numbers, right? So, yeah. so both that dichotomy, it's difficult, but I think important to keep in mind. Excellent. Uh, so we have about... Oh, two or three minutes. Okay. So we're going to have to wrap up. So that's... Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to ask if you could do it in 20 seconds of each one of you. I don't know. Um, I'm done. <laughs> What'd you say, Katarina? I'm done. You're done. So, Kater okay, Katarina's done. Um, but let's, uh, Faith and Sarah, if you could round us out on this last piece, which would be individuals that have left whatever the system is, could be academia, could be uh, for because there was harassment, there was some trauma, there was they didn't deal well with whatever, um, and so for their own survival and their well-being, they just left. But there's still, as um, Erica was mentioning, there's still scientists, and there may not be in that pra traditional practitioner kind of role. How do we support, still support them um, as uh, in, in the STEM enterprise, so to speak, or, or, or such? Do you feel? I actually don't know if I know how to answer that question. Okay. Yeah, and I, um, I went philosophical. Yeah, because so, yeah. um, I kind of went like three different ways. Um, <laughs> I actually did leave a field. Um, I used to be an environmental journalist. I was an environmental journalist for about 12 years, and the harassment, abuse, bullying, trauma, constant exposure to vicarious trauma was so severe, I left. <laughs> and I went into another field that actually has a lot of uh, challenges, but um, that's actually why I'm up here now is because I've been through that, and maybe I can help my uh, colleagues, especially the ones that are coming into the field, understand how to pre potentially prevent that because you think about the brain drain when somebody um, you know, has so much knowledge and they leave a field because of things outside of their control um, that could have been you know, basically categorized as, hey, don't be a jerk. Um, so the, I think about the brain drain a lot because um, you know, I also know people in the adaptation and the climate fields that are leaving because they just feel like they don't want to do it anymore because they are, they're, they're just, it's, they're overwhelmed and they can't continue to function like that. So, um, you know, is there a way to fully prevent that? I don't know because everybody is an individual, but there are ways that we can systemically alter how we're, we're operating and treating people and expecting of people to maybe help make, think, make our work more sustainable, whether that's research, science, academia, or uh, extension, applied world, et cetera. So you did answer. Okay, good. <laughs> I did all to, to, to Katarina's point, you shared a story. I did. You shared a story and very powerful. Let's end there. Please help me uh, uh, give our panelists a wonderful round of applause. And also, thank you, Brandon. One round of applause for Brandon for moderating our panel. Um, I just want to leave you with two things. The first is that on uh, on Friday last week, we had an article published by some of the pam uh, panel members and myself. Uh, you can find the, the website here uh, talking about the emotional toll that climate, cha uh, climate change can take on science professionals. And in that, we lay out some particular ways that we can be supporting earth science professionals as we move forward for the next uh, centennial. I also want to highlight Brandon's uh, session. He'll actually be giving a talk on Wednesday uh, at 13, uh, 1340 in Moscow and South 20, uh, two, uh, 216, where he's going to be talking about uh, some of the career stresses that acad academics uh, face. So I want to leave you with that. Thank you all so much for coming. And I want to thank our panelists for their courage, their empathy, and their wisdom on this topic. Thank you.